We are talking about the very latest now in the fight against COVID and Dr. Malathi Srinivasan joining us now from Stanford Healthcare. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Anne. Of course, the mask mandate for most California schools is now being lifted. And this comes at the same time as we're getting the results of a new CDC study talking about the efficacy of masks when it comes to slowing the spread of COVID. What did that study say? So the CDC study on masks in school showed that wearing masks in school by students and staff decreased transmission of coronavirus by about 23%. Now this was done in a study in Arkansas, which was in a hot zone where the transmission rate for COVID was very high. And uh, they looked at about 233 school districts all over Arkansas um, from uh, August to October of 2021. So that was when Delta was really raging. And um, they found that uh, about a third of the schools had a full mask mandate and 50% of them had no mask mandate and the rest were kind of in between. And the vaccination rates of this community were very low. They were 13 to 20%, so not like California. And when they looked at all of the people who had had coronavirus, Um, uh, and looked at the transmission rates in schools, there was a 23% risk reduction in cases for staff members and for students. And uh, uh, and this is of course, you know, kids don't always wear masks well, neither do staff, they're coming on and off, they're running in and off the playground. So it's not a full protection, but even partially wearing their masks with the mask mandates made a big difference. And uh, the less of a mandate there was and the fewer people who were wearing uh, masks, the less the protection you had. So what, what this tells us is a couple of things. The first is it's a really good reminder that masks are a very important part of a multimodal approach to airborne infection prevention. And uh, we, it, we and if you say, you know, we know that uh, Omicron generally is more mild uh, for people who get it, you know, why is this important? Um, especially when hospitalization rates are dropping in the US for uh, Omicron, um, you know, from our peak of 150,000 hospitalizations and 25,000 ICU cases um, per day kind of in mid-January to now less than 30,000 hospitalized and about, you know, 7,000 uh, nationwide in the ICUs. The, the issue is twofold. The first one is that Omicron infections are still at 100,000 uh, per day and they're killing about 2,000 Americans per day. And so that's still important, uh, even though the total numbers are low because the or the percentages are low because the total numbers are so high with our population, it's so important. And the second thing that's very important that people keep on forget to talk about is long COVID. Um, we, we think that the percentage of people who have long COVID is probably for all comers about 5%, but the more severe your infection, the more likely you are to get it. And there's a, a, a group of people who get long COVID, you know, the shortness of breath, the brain fog, the fatigue, the problems regulating their blood pressure and their heart rate, the sweating, um, and just that really terrible feeling of not feeling right. Um, uh, We think it's probably gonna be between 10 to 20% of those people who have very long-term symptoms, like up to about uh, 18 months. So it's important for us to still think about wearing masks when we are in public and uh, in schools, if it's mask optional, um, and your child can tolerate it, it's not a bad idea to continue. Okay, of course, as you mentioned, the study coming out of a state that doesn't have a lot of people vaccinated, do you have concerns when you look at California potentially lifting this? Yeah, I'm less concerned about California than states with lower vaccination rates. The vaccinations uh, do make a big difference uh, for people who have COVID. We know that the older mRNA vaccines, the, the mRNA vaccines that we have right now, are less effective against Omicron than they were against Delta, but they're still partially effective and they still seem to help prevent death. So our state's probably gonna do better than others with the drop in mass mandate. And as long as all the kids are vaccinated and the staff are vaccinated, uh, we should still be careful, but um, I think the major concern is for the unvaccinated population. Okay. What about concerns over the new variant we're now hearing about this BA2? And of course, this is coming just as Omicron does start to subside. Right, right. So Omicron BA2 is about 30% more contagious than Omicron BA1. Now, it was first reported in South Africa and took South Africa by storm. And it also led to a second Omicron surge in Denmark. But in the U.S., the BA2 Omicron virus is spread much more slowly and is currently about 4% of all uh, COVID cases. Now, that's so far. 
We'll know more in the next few weeks. And we know that overall, the number of hospitalizations and ICU admissions are, are going down. So we think that part of the reason the spread has been muted is for, for two reasons. The first is that um, we have a large number of people in the United States as opposed to other countries vaccinated. Um, and we know that vaccination reduces the rates of infection and illness by about 70% and also reduces uh, long COVID by about 80 to 90%. But again, the concern is that the mRNA vaccines don't work as well against Omicron, and it's less treatable by sotrovimab, which is one of our monoclonal antibodies that works very effectively against Omicron and is part of our outpatient regimen that we have. So, you know, our outpatient treatments, uh, Paxlovid and sotrovimab, um, are uh, very important, and we use the um, uh, sotrovimab for uh, people who are pregnant or who have uh, end-stage kidney disease or liver failure and transplant. So we're using it because it's got a very good side effect profile. We still do have our uh, standard remdesivir and malnupiravir. Um, uh, and also there's a new medication that was approved by Lilly for outpatient uh, treatment of uh, Omicron as well. So we, we have some treatments that uh, are effective uh, along, with we, uh, along with the vaccinations. But I think that we need to kind of sit tight and see first if uh, Omicron BA2 is going to be as catchy as uh, uh, it has been in Europe. And second, um, if we can get a new set of vaccines that will be effective against uh, Omicron BA2. So for people who have already had the first iteration of Omicron, is there a chance that we could get this as well? So we've got some good news on that front. Uh, and the Omicron BA1 infection provides pretty strong protection against uh, BA2, but prior Delta infection doesn't provide protection against BA2. So this is coming from a study in Denmark where about 2 million people had been positive for COVID between November and February. And only about 1,700 people were documented to have reinfection. And this is uh, when they've had two tests that were positive, separated by about a month or two months. And they didn't sequence all of those 1,700, but of the ones who had a sequence, about 260, about a fifth of them had reinfection with uh, B2 after initial infection with B1. But um, of the people that they sequenced, about half of them had uh, B2 after having Delta. So I think that the good news here is that um, BA2 is really unlikely to cause a major wave of infection in communities that have already experienced a BA1 wave. Okay. And when it comes to variants and subvariants, it's probably only a matter of time that we're going to see the next one. Any clue at this point, if you could look into your crystal ball of what that might look like? Well, let me shake that crystal ball and take a good look <laughs> in. Um, so I think that the answer is, is that uh, coronaviruses mutate and they have been infecting uh, humanity for a very long time. And we're going to see another wave. It's just a matter of time. Uh, historically, if you kind of take a look at it, we had SARS, um, uh, SARS-1 in tw uh, 2003, and the case fatality rate was pretty high, but this is, uh, it was, you know, 14 to 15% of all cases and over 50% of people who were over 65. And this was when we didn't have widespread testing. So those case fatality numbers might be uh, higher than you we would get if we actually knew the denominator. But then um, a MERS came out in, um, uh, I think it was 2013, 2012, 2013, and that had that was much more lethal. That had a case fatality rate of 30%. And of course, now we have a SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, which we're just calling COVID, and uh, uh, that has a case fatality rate. It, again, it depends. It's between you know really like one to 15%, depending on um, how old you are, and over 50% again if you're over 80. Uh, excuse me, over 20% if you're um, over 80. So it really depends on uh, who you are and all your comorbidities, but um, the things that can determine whether or not a uh, coronavirus is going to really be important for us to pay attention to is first, is the new strain more lethal? Uh, second, is it more catchy with increased transmissibility the way we saw with uh, Omicron? And the third, is it more resistant to our treatments or is it more immunivating the way Omicron uh, BA2 is? So, you know, Delta was certainly one of our most lethal of uh, the coronavirus variants and these viruses mutate really fast. Um, the uh, majority of the mutations don't lead to more lethality, which is why we're not seeing people get more sick. And one of the really good things that's happened is that with the widespread immunization, the worldwide immunization, which I hope will be complete over the next one to two years, uh, I, we're going to have a smaller reservoir for people to actually get uh, the coronaviruses. 
So the hope is, is that with widespread vaccination, the same way we decreased polio and we decreased so many of the other serious infectious illnesses, that uh, if we can get enough people, the, the host response will be better and we won't have such a reservoir. Okay. We know you're going to keep us posted as this all uh, unfurls. That's a lot of information. Dr. Malathy Srinivasan with Stanford Healthcare. Thanks for being with us here on uh, CBS News Bay Area. It's so great to see you again.